So our speaker for today is Dr. Nicholas Spears. Dr. Nicholas Spears is a spiritual leader, teacher, and therapist in the Richmond community area. Currently, Dr. Spears works as a professor at Hampton University, where he teaches and trains future mental health counselors, school counselors, and pastoral counselors. He holds a master's from New York University in mental health and wellness counseling and a doctorate from Virginia Commonwealth in counseling education and supervision. Lastly, Dr. Spears has a passion for helping, mentoring, and supporting young men from historically underrepresented and marginalized communities. So I'm going to turn the show over to Dr. Spears for the next hour or so. This is, this is your home. <laughs> Appreciate you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Y'all can get a little louder than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. I want to thank you all for coming today. It's a Saturday morning. Y'all are awake. Um, so you can be anywhere on a Saturday, but you're here. So I definitely appreciate you being here. Before I get started, I do want to thank Ryan Kendall for inviting me. I know you said step back for inviting me to speak. Um, it is an honor. I never take it for granted when I have an honor to speak um, and just talk and impart. Also, I wanted to thank my colleague who's on his way, Dr. Norton, um, who has a practice, Norton Therapeutic Solutions. He wants to give you guys some information about it and just tell you more about how we can be of support to you during this time. And last but not least, I want to thank my lovely wife, Dr. Jennifer Spears. Can we please give her a hand clap? <laughs> and my three children, Nicholas, Julia, and James, um, they all got up at six o'clock this morning and drove down here from Richmond. So praise the Lord. All right. So I do want to just kind of jump into today quickly. I don't want to be before, I don't want to be here before you long because um, I do want to get invited back one day. I promise to be brief, <laughs> but I'm Dr. Nicholas Spears. I'm a professor at Hampton University. This is my second year. Um, I also work as a therapist in addition to a spiritual leader at Grace and Peace Center in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I did want to discuss just how crisis exposes the cracks in our foundation. So if you're taking notes, can you write that down? And we will take notes. So I ask everyone to take notes. But crisis often exposes cracks in our foundation. I'll say that one more time. Crisis often exposes cracks in our foundation. Can we all say it together? Crisis exposes cracks in our foundation. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. You're asking great questions. Um, my foundation started in Staten Island, New York, where, where, where I'm from. And when I was about four years old, my parents separated and they divorced later on. Um, following their separation and divorce, I dealt with issues of abandonment, rejection, low self-esteem, and I even developed a bad stutter. So during my childhood, formative years, middle school, I was looking for identity. And I would try to seek validation in clothes, haircuts, girls, and just how I looked. So that's where all my allowance money would go. And I realized looking back that that was only a Band-Aid on a wound that required stitches. All right, does anybody know what happens when you peel back a Band-Aid that's on a wound that needs stitches? It all over you, and you Absolutely. You reopen the wound. And not only do you bleed on yourself, but you bleed on those around you. So as I stated, my parents separated when I was four years old. And I wouldn't see my father again until I was 16, 16 years old. And, and, and the only reason why I saw him is because at 16, I ran away to my paternal grandmother's house. 
in Virginia, his mother. And I pretty much forced him to be in my life, only to find out that he had that he himself had a mental health diagnosis. And now what I know to be undiagnosed schizophrenia. So that was a big blow, burst my bubble. In fact, it led to depression. I lost motivation, got in trouble, hung out with the wrong crowd. Um, and eventually, in my senior year, I was expelled from high school, expelled. Um, however, because of my grades, they allowed me to graduate. Um, so I graduated and my mother gave me an option. She said, either you go to college or you be homeless. <laughs> so I chose Morgan State. Um, <laughs> and I was at Morgan State for probably a year and a half until I failed out because I didn't have the motivation. And it wasn't until I became a father at 21 years old that I developed a sense of purpose. Um, my son, Nigel, who's not here today, he's in New York. Um, I developed a sense of purpose. I knew I wanted to do something. I knew I had to be something. I knew I had to change the trajectory of fatherlessness in my family, but I didn't have a model. I didn't have an example. I didn't know what that looked like. Um, so, you know, my faith definitely helped out a lot, but it wasn't until I recalled the moment where I had to seek therapy and, and, I, and I had to go to a therapist. So in the session, uh, my therapist, helped me come to the understanding. She unpacked my life. And I shared with her that at four years old, um, my parents divorced, but it was because they got into an argument over me asking for food. And she was able to make the connection that all of these years, I'm probably 25, so 21 years, I had been carrying the weight and felt as if I was subconsciously responsible for my parents' divorce. She freed me with the following words. It's not your fault. And she literally helped me heal. Since then, I've been on a path and a trajectory to help others heal. Went on, got a master's from NYU in mental health and wellness counseling, a doctorate from VCU in counselor education, and now I'm currently a professor at Hampton University helping other counselors help people heal. So, with that being said, I do want us to take a questionnaire. There is a questionnaire that we're going to take. But before we do, there's a mantra that I subscribe to. And I know it's a struggle for some people to talk about things that are sensitive. Some people are looking at me right now like, brother, you just told all your business. You cannot heal a wound by pretending it's not there. If you're taking notes, please write that down. What is nice, by the way, you cannot heal a wound by pretending it's not there. Let's all say it together. You cannot heal a wound by pretending it's not there. Often in our communities, we attempt to heal wounds by pretending they're not there. In fact, I don't know if you grew up in this household where what happens in this house stays in this house. Therefore, we don't feel comfortable talking about things that affect us, that impact us in life. There's such a stigma. In fact, I know with the new generation, that stigma is changing. But in the previous generation, if you told somebody that you had a therapist, you would ask for a check. Check, please. I'm ready to leave. But you cannot heal a wound by simply pretending it's not there. In fact, in most cases, what we've gone through, it's not about what's wrong with you. It's about what happened to you. Because if what happened to you didn't happen to you, you would be somebody completely different. I'm going to say that one more time. All right. Sometimes it's not about what's wrong with you. It's about what happened to you. Because if you didn't go through what you experienced, you would be somebody completely different. And therapy is powerful. Therapy, I'm an existentialist. It causes you to have a reset. When you begin to heal from the wounds that you have endured and experienced in life, you now become the version of yourself that you would have been if you had never gone through trauma. Therapy is powerful. 
But you cannot, come on, let's all say it together. You can't, I know it's early, but we're going to say it together in unison. You cannot heal a wound by pretending it's not there. All right, so there's a question there and a survey that we're going to take um, in, in a minute. I do want to give you all some background about it. It is called the ACE questionnaire, which stands for, I guess I'll write it down, Adverse Childhood Experiences. So essentially, and I'm about to tell my age a little bit here, Barbara Walters. Anybody remember who Barbara Walters is? Anybody know who that is? 2020? All right. All right. You've been here for a little minute. Barbara Walters. She came out with this uh, um, segment on uh, obesity camps, or what we call the incorrect term is fat camps. So obesity camps. And they noticed that the camp worked. All right. So that means that these teenagers would go to the camp and they would lose weight. And they noticed that these individuals, about half the group would put the weight back on when they went home. And they couldn't understand why is this program effective for some people and not others? So they came out with this ACE questionnaire that measured trauma and adverse childhood experiences. And what they noticed is that if an individual answered yes to four of the questions, they had a proclivity for certain life outcomes, all right? Phys physical problems, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, that's sugar for some folks, hypertension, high blood pressure, all right? Cancer and even early death. In addition, they noticed that the, the individuals that answered four or well, yes to four questions, also had a likelihood for incarceration, divorce, and obesity, health problems again. And it's just four. When they give this questionnaire to minorities, our people, black men, that number jumps anywhere from six to sometimes eight. All right? And a lot of people are just coping with life, with issues that they've discovered, that, that they've experienced with never getting any true healing. Now, some of what we're about to read, I, 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 I just want to warn you, it's triggering and it's sort of like an iceberg. All right. Where's the greatest mass of an iceberg? Somebody help me out. The greatest mass of an iceberg at the bottom, underneath the surface. So what that means is what you can see, all right, only tells you a small portion of what's actually going on. Most of what we're experiencing is happening underneath. This is why crisis often exposes the cracks in our foundation. During this pandemic, I'm gonna go here. During the pandemic, people got exposed different realities, different things that we deal with, we no longer were able to mask, okay, our, our trauma or unhealed wounds behind the barbershops. The barbershops was closed. The nail salon was closed. You couldn't go to the gym, all right? The things that we normally do, you couldn't even go to church. The things that we normally do to escape, we no longer had access to. And most people had to look in the mirror. And because of, of unhealed wounds, they noticed that they had um, cracks in their foundation. So we're gonna read through this questionnaire. Let me grab my paper. And then we're gonna process it. Okay. All right, it's a little wet, but we are gonna get through it. <laughs> All right, so the first question is, did a parent or other adult and your household often swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that made you afraid that you might be physically hurt. Now, I do want to do a little disclaimer, all right? I know it's common in our community where, phys where physical discipline is the number one choice. And some folks will call that good parenting. I got three kids. Can't say I don't agree. However, some 
of the physical discipline is extreme. And we get to a point where people begin to compare, all right, trauma and physical discipline. They say, well, I got hit with a shoe. Well, that's nothing. I got a broom thrown at me. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's problematic, all right? And some of us know where it stems from. So if this happened to you, you would answer yes to the question. Did a parent or other adult in your household swear at you, insult you, put you down, or humiliate you, or act in a way that you might be physically hurt? If that happened, this is a yes, all right? And this is a safe space. You don't have to share your score, but this is just so you know, all right, for your own information. All right, can somebody read number two? And you can read number three, sir. Thank you. Did a parent or other adult in the household often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you? Okay. Or? Okay. So if that happened, you would put a yes. Again, physical discipline. If you were physically disciplined, even if you felt you deserved it, you would still put a yes. All right, sir, sir, would you like to read number three? And I just want to just warn everybody, trigger warning, you know, this is about sexual abuse. Yes, sir. Okay. So... I do want to highlight that there is a dynamic that does exist where um, a young man and, you know, we have majority young, young men in the room will um, have sex or engage in sexual activity with an older woman or an older teenager. And that counts as well. I know it's a rite of passage. People pride, you know, themselves on this happening. But the problem is, is that your brain doesn't really develop until 25. And most women are at least two years ahead, even though you might be the same age. So in other words, those women know what they're doing, and you may not. All right. Can somebody read number four? Yes, sir. Okay, if that happened, you will put a one for yes. A one for yes. All right, can someone read number five? Okay, so this relates to whether your parent had a substance use disorder. So whether they have some type of addiction. Okay. Can someone read number six? Okay, you will put a yes or no. I do want to highlight something real quick when it comes to separation and divorce. Um, you know, we live in a culture where, you know, marriage and, you know, marriage is not necessarily the standard in some people's life. Um, we have a lot of, you know, relationships and, you know, co-parenting that's happening. What I do want to highlight something, and I find it interesting, I haven't researched it yet, but I plan on it, is the term anxiety in the Greek language means divided or split. Or some would even say separated. and multiple actions. And when you think about the dynamic that takes place, all right, and even my own personal st um, story, I developed a stutter because of anxiety after my parents separated. Um, you know, your parents essentially represent the foundation to who you are. And when you have it separated, your time is split, your love is split, your affection is split. And, and in my case, because, you know, my father abandoned my family, um, a part of me was missing that I was searching for. So 
if your parents were ever separated, divorced, and this even includes if they were never married, you may possibly have a proclivity for anxiety. All right, can somebody read number, I'll read number seven, because this is a little bias, all right? This was done in the 90s. So was your mother or stepmother, it could have been your father or stepfather, often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes or often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, or hit with something hard, ever repeatedly hit over at least a few times or threatened with a gun or a knife. I've had people ask, does this include if she tried to run him over with the car? Yes, it does. All right. So if that happened, you would put a yes. All right. Can someone read number eight? Okay. So this includes if anybody in your house had, had a substance use or some type of addiction. All right. Um, can someone read number nine? I think the brother in the back, you've been raising your hand a lot. So I'm going to call on you. Okay. And this also includes if they were undiagnosed. I know we have a lot of undiagnosed relatives and family members that may have never received treatment, but you had an idea that something was wrong. There's a stigma about the angry black woman. It might not be anger. She might be depressed or suffering from something. It's just not a person's personality. You know, things don't just, ha just you know, it's not, what's, it's not about what's wrong with the person, but something may have happened. All right. Can someone read number 10? The last one. Okay, did a household member go to prison? All right, because that brings on feelings of grief, which I would like to get into, but we probably don't have time. So tally up your scores. You can tally up your scores. And I want to share my score. Out of six. A six on that list. And they say a four is all you need. So I'm above average in terms of trauma, which is why I need therapy twice. All right. Twice. I had to go twice and I still go and seek support and help. All right. Because I understand, you know, this, this is a lot to be carrying. You know, we're human. We're not designed to go through these experiences without having any consequences. I still need help. I still need support, even though I am a supporter. Um, and it's important. You know, that we acknowledge these things because you cannot. Come on, y'all. Let's all say it together in unison. That sounds good. All right. So I do want to take the rest of the time to process um, what this was like, you know, what this experience was like. I didn't want to be before you long and then give you some information. Dr. Norton, you know, we're going to give you some information on how we can support you. So, so do we have another mic? Okay. All right. So what was this like? You know, I, I, you know, you don't have to share your score, but you know, this is, this is an opportunity for us to talk. So talk with the therapist and we got two in the room just in case. Hey, good. Can you guys hear me? Test us. Yes, All right. Good morning. Good morning. I feel like I'm a fan. Spirits, me and him work together. First of all, I haven't seen anyone do the ACE as transparently and like community focused as you. So I think it's important that we formalize mental health, right? We talk about these different experiences because Jay Z actually said, You can't heal what you don't reveal, but I like yours. Um, but I think it's important that we kind of use this time to talk about what it is to experience, what it is to kind of tap into these resources because you guys have two black doctors who are here and that's kind of what we do. So I just want to start off by saying that and thank you guys for allowing me to be here. Thank you, Doc. All right, any comments? Yes, sir. So I know that we were talking about um, domestic traumas and um, 
traumas that we usually experience inside the household. But um, most of my trauma wasn't. Well, I have I've had some like traumatic moments. I wouldn't say that they happened inside the house though. I've had a lot of moments. I've had a lot of moments where it was like outside the house, where it was like people my age that were like putting me through stuff or like said stuff to me that really hurt and just stuck with me for a really long time. So um, that's another way of like that I that I think about like childhood experiences. Like most of my childhood experiences come from outside, like at school or on sports teams where people like discriminated against me or people made fun of me a lot because I'm a bigger kid. So that happened a lot when I was younger. Um, thank you. What you speak to is, you know, negative messages that we received over the years that become thoughts that we have to fight our whole adult life. You know, sometimes just identifying the root like you just did, knowing where it comes from can sort of help you to take every thought captive. All right. And hold on to it and, and really hold it up to see whether this is true whether this is true, where, where did this come from? I have to do it myself, you know, you know, before, before I speak, I'm often reminded in my mind about my stutter. And as a kid, and I have to tell myself, you know, I'm going to be anxious for nothing, but I'm going to experience peace, which surpasses all understanding. And, you know, the purpose is to really take your thoughts, hold them captive. All right. And really ensure like, is this true about me? And it's a fight. I appreciate you bringing that up. All right. Any, any, anyone else would like to share what this was like? Did you know these things? Yes, sir. Yes, for the live. And uh, to speak what you were saying about kind of those negative messages that you got. I'm like a fly dude, right? So you want to challenge those thoughts. People can say what they want, but it's really from the internal. So whatever they're saying, challenge it like Dr. Spears is saying and kind of promote that positivity because how we think impacts how we feel and how we feel impacts how we act. So you seem pretty fly to me, man. Keep, keep. Absolutely. All right, anyone else? I know this is putting you on the spot. It's a large room, but this is a no judgment zone. Especially after I don't put all my business out there. Somebody better say something. <laughs> Anybody else? What was this like? Did you know these things that were on the list? Said that. No? Okay. So what was it like finding out that these things could affect you? I'm going to tell you it was new. And the reason why it was new was because it's something that I didn't really think about, you know? I mean, the people that go through this is kind of hard. I know that. I haven't really gone through it myself, to my memory, but it's surprising to know that people go through it, and it's hard. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. All right. Any, any, anyone else? Any adults in the room? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. My son, Titus, is going to be embarrassed, but that's okay. I'm going to speak up anyway. So... Um, I just want to, first of all, thank you for bringing this to light. I went through the questionnaire and I saw a lot of things that I didn't realize that were problematic for me. And I know I have done those things to him mm. and didn't realize it because it was just something we did in our family with our culture. We were not taught. We didn't get a book as a parent on how to re rear our children. Yeah. And each child is individually yeah. different. Mm -hmm. So you have to adjust according to that situation. Yeah. As a single mother going, we went through the divorce. We mm -hmm. went through the domestic violence. Everything you listed, I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. And I felt a certain way because I just didn't realize that this was going to impact him later. Mm -hmm. So then I'm pushing and pushing and pushing. And I'm like, wait a minute. He didn't even know that this was an issue. What am I pushing? Mm-hmm. So as a parent, I think it's very important that we really uncover those things that we need to heal and not have all these different expectations, especially for our sons. And because it's breaking them, I think, in mm -hmm. a way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. You know, I appreciate you sharing that. You know, you drop you drop so many points just now. Um, I don't I don't know if I can address all of them, but um, you know, just in terms of recognizing, 
you know, some of the legacies that we received from the previous generations, some that were passing down. I don't know the old story, but it's a story about, uh, uh, you know, you know, a family on Thanksgiving. And before they would make the turkey, they would always chop the legs off, you know, of the turkey. So, you know, they would prep this whole turkey and then chop the legs off. So they would do it from like five generations and they couldn't, under they couldn't understand. So, you know, I think the millennial generation or Gen Z started cooking and they said, wait, hold up, we hungry. Like you've been cooking for three days. Like you mean to tell me you got to chop the turkey legs off now? No, put that in the oven. So they asked, why do we do that? And they discovered that five generations previously, somebody's grandmother didn't have a big enough pot. But it's just been passed down from one generation to the next. And, and you know, being, you know, being a single mom, you know, raising kids is hard for two people. And I think, you know, single mothers, like, they, they, they have to play so many different roles and wear so many different hats. So, you know, definitely give yourself grace. Um, definitely commend you. Um, if, if there's any other single mothers in the room, can we please just give y'all a hand clap for what y'all do and bringing your sons here on a Saturday because it's big because you're investing. All right, I think someone in the back, someone in the back. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh -huh. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, my son, Edward, I have another son named Jay. He's thankfully, uh, he's in the Air Force right now. But in reading the list and identifying things in my own life, I understood that before I could raise my children, I had to raise myself. Mm. Um, to break the cycle that was always already present within my family, breaking that cycle wasn't easy because I had to breaking breaking those those traumatic instances because the sexual trauma, the um, being as you say, criticized for just who you are, being put down in, in many kind of ways just because you're different, even by family, was very traumatic in its own way. So in learning that and understanding that, I was like, when I have my kids, I'm not going to do any of this. I'm not going to do none of that. But in having my kids, I found myself doing some of those same things. But I also had to take a step back and also look and say, okay, is this being right for them? Because when I started seeing some of their behavior start to be like mine, I was like, you're not doing something right. So taking that internal look for us as parents, single parents, even married couples, it's a good thing. Because when I took that internal look and I started presenting the things that I was like, what do I want for them? When I wanted what I wanted for them and I started giving those things, what I got back was healing in its own way as well. Because it let me know that those that criticized me for being that single parent criticized me for saying, no, my child isn't going to be over here. I'm going to make this move to stay in this more expensive place, this more expensive area, because I can't, I don't want to carry every day. I don't want to have to carry just so I can protect my child. I don't want him or I want him to be out there to um, have to fight his way through everything that goes on. I want him to be able to go to school and say, okay, I can learn what it is. I don't have to stress or be scared of what's outside when I go out. Um, and I saw that change within my kids and what they have because in answering this questionnaire and I saw what he answered, he was like, no, no, no. I was like, really? No. I was like, okay. So I say that to say what you do for yourself it benefits your children as well. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please, please give her a hand clap. That was awesome. That was awesome. Um, you know, I think you also speak to just being self-reflective, the importance of being self-reflective, you know, paying attention to, you know, just some of the things that we've learned. As I always say, some of it is uh, taught. Some of it is caught, you know, but we pass it down to the rest of the generation. Um, you, you know, when I think about just some of the values that I wanted to place on my kids, I realized that my mother and her village was raising me for a world that doesn't exist anymore. And we're raising these kids for a world that we don't even know about. So, you know, the goal is, you know, we have to change. We have to constantly be self-reflective. So I definitely appreciate that wisdom. Thank you. Any Anyone else want to share? Yes, Brother Ryan. Um, <clears throat> we actually have a question from social media. Uh, and the question is, I see some of this in my stepchild. How do I help them? Mm. Wow. 
That's a that's a heavy one. Because you know, blended family, blended families are complicated. You know, they're complicated. And I think people people want to, I guess, have this expectation that okay, we're gonna try our best to make this situation as normal as possible. And abnormality shows up. I think when you have an expectation for abnormality to show up, you know, it makes it more realistic and you know how to address things and things don't necessarily catch you off guard. That, you know, that's a roundabout answer um, to just kind of describe and just say, you know, patience is definitely key and, and, and just learning, being open to learning. It's very complicated. You know, sometimes I think, you know, there's, there's so many different moving parts. I don't know the situation with the biological parents and just the influence and impact that they have, but therapy, <laughs> being intentional about therapy, family therapy is, is powerful. It's a powerful tool. And even if you can, I don't know their situation, bringing in the biological parents to make sure everybody is on the same page. All right. Doc, you got anything for that? Oh. No, no, I, was say <laughs> I think we got two in the back. <laughs> so just in regard to the therapy, because I know there's a stigma with mental health, right? The more we talk about it, the more we normalize it. But I do want to kind of hand out my cards, myself and Dr. Spears. We work in Newport News. We have an agency. Uh, I do my thing on TikTok as well, trying to promote like mental health and innovation and stuff like that. So as you ask these last two questions, I'll just be going around. If that's okay, just giving out my card, our cards and things like that. All right. Uh, yes, ma'am. In the back. Sorry. Hey, good morning again. Good morning. I got like a lot of situations that I can identify <laughs> to. <laughs> um, I'm divorced. And I have, I don't have stepkids, but my ex-husband's stepkids call me their bonus mom. It's a situation. And um, for the person that is asking about having stepkids, you maintain your consistency in their lives, maintain who you are and be consistent with it. Don't, when their attitude acts up, you don't act up. You have to maintain, because if you don't, then it gives them a reason. You have to also understand that they're bringing in another household with you. So the things that may be going on on the back end that you don't understand are things that you can't deal with, but you can deal with and control who you are and the situation which you are. And amazingly enough, that young man or young lady who that you, who you well, she says, son, sorry. Um, the young man that you have will see and understand because they're gonna it's gonna be a situation that just brings about a whole entire change. So be consistent, stay consistent, stay loving, and amazing enough, they will address and um recognize that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Appreciate the wisdom. There's so much wisdom in the room. Um uh, are there any other questions, any thoughts, any reactions? to you know this talk this discussion because i mean it operates on so many different levels everyone has a different situation um you know that they're dealing with so this is an opportunity for you to share if you would like to yes ma'am mm -hmm. yeah that that has stepped up to take over as a maternal, mm -hmm. from a maternal standpoint or a paternal standpoint. So my situation was with my son. Mm -hmm. And I have three grandkids. This is DeMarcus, the youngest of the three. Mm -hmm. And we scored right at four. Mm -hmm. The word there that you have on there, that sentence, you cannot heal a wound by pretending it's not there. That's something we are still challenging now yeah. with DeMarcus. And as he proceed on through life, uh, I hope today that this will help him to open up and just, you know, realize that, hey, I've got to do this for myself anyway, and for his mm -hmm. future and for his family, you know, that history does not repeat itself. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of grandparents out there. So I applaud all the grandparents. If there are any yeah. other grandparents in yeah, here today. Yeah, we just want to appreciate the uh, grandparents. Awesome. Uh, me and my husband did 13 years, and we had to adopt them wow. uh, in order to take care of them that long. Yeah. From one state to another state. Yeah. And he's done excellent well, just yeah. really excellent well. From school, started out 
lot of problems, you know, in his younger years, but he's graduated and moved on. Yeah. So I'm really proud of him. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank Amazing. You. you got a good grandmother, Demarcus. You got a good grandmother, Demarcus. Um, you know, you know, grand grandparents are important because they give you, you know, they give you, I guess, experiences from a generation that doesn't exist. You know, they give you, you know, legacy and culture. I know I ran away to my granny um when I when I was 16 and she had me with open arms, you know, just giving me the love and support that I need. So thank you so much for all that you do. Appreciate you. All right. Any anyone else? Any reactions? Any questions? You got anything, Doc? This is my wife, Dr. Jennifer. I don't put you on the spot. No? You good? All right. <laughs> yes, sir. Having uh, spent many years in education and working with young people of all ages, right on from uh, kindergarten right on through, well, even higher ed, where I've uh, been an adjunct professor at uh, several several universities, uh, the whole dynamic of mental health, coming from a person in the senior years seemingly has changed dramat dramatically. Um, and it's really concerning. Even in the youth group that we have here, we have challenges among this group, which is multiplied multiple times, thousands of times out in the community. The whole idea of suicide, the whole idea of anxiety, uh, the social media aspect where Young people are, are willing to take their own life because of social media. It's extremely concerning, and it's one in which uh, you have to question what's next on the horizon and how do we prepare uh, our young people of today so that they can withstand the winds that they're about to face, uh, given all of the social ills of our society that we are, we are facing from racism to whatever, uh, climate change and all. Any words of wisdom as to us as parents, as to how we can help guide our young people, especially whether the, what are the signs that we begin to look for uh, to offset some of the traumatic experiences that they're going through? I can't even imagine being a teenager there. Uh, the worst thing that we we concerned about was cigarettes when I was coming through school. Um, and of course, it's it's uh, the whole gamut now. And it has to be extremely tough as a parent to raise a child and even tougher as a young person going through all the experiences that they they have to face on a day to day basis. Thank you for that question. Appreciate it. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of parents in the room are wondering the same thing. You know, we've just gone through a pandemic. To add a pandemic on top of that, isolation, um, virtual learning, feeling burnt out. On top of that, you know, the different things that people face. Um, you know, I think the best thing, and I try this with my son, is learning how to listen. Learning how to listen as parents. I know I wasn't able to speak you know, when I was a kid, because children are to be seen and not heard where I came from. So, you know, just really listening to him, listening to what he's going through, um, hearing his heart, because there is a lot of pressures now. You know, there's a lot of, um, I guess, issues related to identity, social media. You know, now, I mean, I've I got into fights when I was in high school, but now it's documented and might go viral. You know, there's so many different pressures, you know, that young people face that the previous generation didn't have to. Um, so I definitely think listening, being compassion, compassionate, um, and I have to lean on faith, offering some type of faith. You know, faith, faith is uh, um, what sustains most people. It anchors most people. Um, and even not even from a religious aspect, like faith, like we really... We really live in a universe <laughs> where we're not able to see and understand everything. Like it's so humbling 
because we're finite. And, you know, just when a person does have some type of faith that sustains them, that anchors them, it allows them to persevere and get through certain things, which is a lot different from religion and rules, but teaching people, you know, about spiritual wholeness and spiritual wellness, you know, making sure that you're taking care of yourself, your well-being, taking breaks from social media. Social media is addictive. <laughs> it's addictive. It's hard for me to put my phone down sometimes. I'm scrolling. And I see Dr. Norton <laughs> dancing because he dances on TikTok and on Instagram. Um, but social media is addictive. I have to take a break. On Saturdays, no. Well, I mean, my kids are on electronics now to keep them quiet. But Saturdays, we don't use electronics. You know, we watch movies. You know, we relax as a family and just really get to know each other. My 13-year-old son hated it first. Now he looks forward to it. So really learning how to take breaks. Yes, sir. Also, because I'll speak as a social media expert. I don't want to call myself an expert, but uh, <laughs> so I'll say social media, it promotes a lot of values, right? So fast money, fast cars, traveling, right? Everything is glorified. I think the best thing to do with this generation that's coming up, you have to know what you value, right? Dr. Spears values family. He values his faith. He values integrity and he moves like that, right? So whatever your values are, it's important that you have that conversation with your family, but live in that value, right? So don't just say, hey, I value honesty, and then you're going around and X, Y, and Z, right? You have to identify your values and truly try to live in those values because social media will, pro you know, it'll promote different highlights. And if you don't really know what you value, it's easy to ascribe to something that may not necessarily be aligned with what you are or where you're going. So know where you're going and know the values that you need to get there and live in those values. That'll be my two cents for the social media. That's a fact. People people only show their highlights. You know, you don't get to see all the L's they took, you know, in between. But people only show their highlights. So I know the time is 1030. I did want to take a minute, um, you know, to, to answer any final questions, any final thoughts. Do we have anything on social media? Did they take the survey on social media? Social. I did that. Okay. And and I'm sorry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, social media did take the survey. A lot of honesty and transparency. Um, a lot of, I guess, low level of trauma. Since you said the average is four, we have some twos, three. I see a one. So people online seem to be pretty, uh, I guess, healthy. Okay. And and you know you know to that pain. Pain is relative, meaning a one or a non you could be a one for me. This one traumatic situation for me may fail like a nine. All right. So it's important to understand that, you know, yeah, this score is a measure, you know, to understand. But if you've gone through something, only really you can individually know how it's impacting you and affecting you. All right. So so I hear my youngest son, James, is telling me to wrap up. <laughs> we have any other final thoughts any questions yes sir oh it was a series of events <laughs> it, was, it was it wasn't just one event it was it was a series of events but to, to answer your question why um you know i was placed in a situation where although i had all my credits to graduate I was probably supposed to be in like a governor school situation, but because I started the school um, after the time, so like November, you know, is when I started, I didn't have an opportunity to do that. So they just put me in random classes, um, you know, was bored, having fun. You know, I was young from New York um, in Cumberland, Virginia. So, you know, it's a culture shock out there. It's different. But, um, you know, definitely hanging out with the wrong crowd, making wrong decisions, um, and just not really understanding how my hurt and my pain was affecting me. So, you know, before long, after a certain amount of referrals, you know, you got to go. So, you know, they gave me the boot. But they did allow me to graduate because I had, you know, the credits. And, you know, I, I was I still had a pretty, pretty decent GPA. I hope that answers your question. Senior year. Senior year. Got expelled. 
So I got uh, somewhat of a loaded question for you. Yes, sir. So um, you kind of hit on it a little bit, but can you share, if you can succinctly, how trauma could put you on the path to committing crime or getting involved in criminal activity? And if someone is already on that pathway or journey, what can parents or the village or the community can do to help get them off of that path? That's a that's that's a heavy question. Um, while while I uh, you know, while you were speaking, I couldn't help but think about this story. I know you know we got to wrap up, but there was a documentary. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. It's called Tattoos on a Heart, and this gang member in L.A. Um, was recalling his life story, and he was talking to like a pastor or a counselor or something like that, and he was recalling this moment when he was seven, where his mom was um, addicted to heroin. And one Saturday morning, regular Saturday, he's watching cartoons and she decides that she's gonna, you know, use heroin. So she shoots up, goes out, comes out of her high, takes two razor blades to her wrist, slits both her wrists, looks him in the face, says, look what you made me do before she drops dead on the floor. He's seven. OK, one of the harder part, the hardest parts of, of being seven is that, you know, he knows how he feels, but he doesn't have the language to describe what he's feeling. So he doesn't have family. He gets placed in the foster care system. He ages out of the foster care system. He gets caught up in gang life. He's looking for family. He's looking for acceptance. And they give him that. And in return, you know, they have him out in the streets putting in work, you know, committing crime. Um, and it wasn't until that he recalls this moment that changed the trajectory of his entire life at seven years old. And he began to heal from it because he talked about it and he continued to talk about it, you know, until, you know, it wasn't such a weight, you know, over his life. So I, I guess the long answer, you know, short is having a community having people who accept you, making sure your child is involved with people, you know, that they aspire to be like, you know, ensuring that there's, that, that there's togetherness, that there's connectedness, connectedness, that there's acceptance around them, because that's essentially what people are looking for. And, you know, the crime and, you know, the gangs and the gang gang, like all of them are literally waiting, you know, for, for new recruits and kids who are in similar situations that feel alone and as if they don't have a space. Um, I know we were gonna share, but we offer a virtual boys group for teenagers. I think the cutoff is 17. So from 13, 14 to 17, uh, we have a virtual space. We meet every Tuesday um, at, uh, man, my kids or something else. We meet every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Um, so just making sure that they have a space and that they have a community that they're a part of is essential. But thank you so much for that question. I hope I hope I hope that answered. I know that was you know, that was long winded. All right. Any anyone else? Are we good to go? All right. So so before we end, Doc, did you want to come up? All right. All right. So I know you have the business card in front of you, and I'm not sure what's on it because I think it might have changed up a little bit. Yeah, 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 look a little different. But, um, you know, we do offer different groups. I know right now um, there's the teenage boys group that I mentioned. We're currently taking slots for a single mothers group. So if you know any single mothers that can benefit, please reach out. Um, in addition to individual therapy, um, as well as group therapy. All right, just to give you guys about the agency. So it's myself, Dr. And there are about four other clinicians. Um, so one thing to make sure that I see is for our community. You know what I'm saying? I teach at Hampton University. Is Dr. Pierce. I had a chance to get about 13 years of experience working in different agencies. And honestly, they don't speak the same language that we speak, right? They, they don't really understand the trial our community and our children. So it's really about us uplifting the community, youth innovation, but most, most importantly, cultural competence, right? All our counselors we use uh, clinical-based interventions, uh, individual. We don't do family yet, uh, but we're, we're continuing to grow with things like that. And like Dr. Spear says, he runs that.
I think it's a really good boys group for them to have that positive kind of outlet, that atmosphere. Earlier, you were talking about like trauma and gangs and things like that. So just to give you guys a little piece. So I'm from the Bronx, New York, uh, single parent household, first generation college, uh, low socioeconomic, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of gangs. I was I grew up in the 90s where they was, you know, slicing people in the face, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Hurt people hurt people. Gang leaders are probably some of the most hurt people that you'll ever meet. So if you want better for your life, you got to be resilient. You got to be able to see past whatever your circumstance is. So don't fall to, you know, the people who are hurt. Continue to, you know, whether it's faith or whether whatever your motivation is, but stick to that motivation and try to align yourself with people with similar goals. That's how you really overcome those kind of situations. Um, That's really all I got to say. But, I mean, this is really great, man. I feel like I'm I'm with family. Thank 200 men, 200 plus men for doing what you guys are doing in the community. Seriously. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. All right. So, thank you all for allowing me to share um, what helped me heal. And I hope if there's anything that we could do to support you, please don't hesitate to reach out. You know, we, we, we are here to serve and, you know, we're showing up for you guys. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.